Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and courtesy of War Historian Battlefield Tours, I'm out here today on Guadalcanal at Alligator Creek. That is, in fact, Alligator Creek right behind me. You might recognize this as the name of the first land engagement on Guadalcanal. Now, the story of the fighting on Guadalcanal is really a story of the Japanese attempting to retake Henderson Field. So, when the U.S. Marines land, they land a little ways up that way on Red Beach, and they march down here, and basically when they take Henderson Field, the, the Japanese occupants just flee into the jungle. There are only a couple of hundred, of Jap couple hundred Japanese infantrymen, a couple thousand Korean laborers, they all take off. They think this is just a, a small raid by the U.S. They go into the jungle, the American troops will depart, they can come back and finish the airfield. Well, that's not what happened. There were 11,000 Marines on the island here to take that airfield and hold it. Now, the Japanese response was incremental, and their first, the first thing that they did was, oh, the Americans aren't leaving, we'd better send a force to kick them off our airfield. And they send the Achiki Detachment, which is just over 900 pretty elite Japanese troops. They came, I believe, out of truck. They were intended to be troops to go to Midway, but they get redirected here to Guadalcanal on short notice. Now, the U.S. Marines have started building a perimeter right over here on August 8th. They land on August 7th. August 8th, they take the airfield and they start building a perimeter. It's not until the 21st that the Japanese arrive, that it, Colonel Ichiki and his men show up here to try and take back the airfield. And in this time, the U.S. Marines have set up a pretty darn solid defensive line just on the west side, that side, of Alligator Creek. By the way, Alligator Creek is also, is locally known as the Elu River. Uh, some of the, the period accounts describe it as the Tenaru because the U.S. misidentified a couple of the rivers here. At any rate, Alligator Creek is the most common name for the battle. So, the U.S. Marines have a thin line of barbed wire. They have machine guns set up. They have 30 cal Browning 1917 water-cooled machine guns. There are some folks who live out here now, by the way. Uh, they also have a bunch of 50 caliber machine guns that they have pulled off of landing craft, Amtraks. They have enough Amtraks that they're not really using a whole lot. They pull the guns off and they use them for the for some of the emplacements in this defensive perimeter. Also, of particular import, they have a couple of 37 millimeter anti-tank guns. Now, the Japanese aren't going to have any tanks in this engagement, but the Americans have canister round for the 37s, and that canister round is absolutely devastating. In fact, it's the machine guns that get most of the attention in historical accounts of this battlefield, but it's really probably the 37 millimeter canister rounds that do the most damage to Ichiki's attacking force. So the way this battle sets up, Colonel Ichiki lands at Taivu Point, miles down the coast here, and his men essentially march up the coastline along the beaches. They cross Red Beach where the Americans had landed, and at about two in the morning on August 21st, they get to this point. Ichiki was, his men were good, and Ichiki was a rather overconfident commander. And his thought was, the airfield's like, the airfield's just the initial objective. We're gonna take the airfield, that's easy. Then we're gonna go do the important stuff, which is going across the sound to uh, Tulagi, Gavudu, Tanambogo, the places where the Japanese had had much more significant emplacements that the Marines had captured at the same time that they landed on Guadalcanal. So, Ichiki didn't put enough planning into his action here, and when his men hit the marine barbed wire, pretty much literally where I'm standing, their rifles were still shouldered. Uh, they get to this point, the marines discover that, hey, we've got Japanese in the wire, they open fire, and it is an absolutely murderous fusillade. Uh, the marine in place positions, variety of guns, canister shot, the Japanese essentially a few, some of the Japanese start to dig in on the east side of the river. That'll, we'll get to that in a moment. There are a number of essentially human wave attacks that come across this sand spit that I'm standing on uh, with the Japanese attempting to overrun the marine lines behind us. All right, so the marine lines are running up the west side of the river. One thing to point out is at the time, this was all Lever Brothers uh, coconut uh, palm tree plantations. And so we have a variety of different sorts of vegetation here today. 
1942, it was all well interspersed palm trees without a lot of ground cover. So the Marines have dug in all the way up the bank of this river, and they're able to deliver enfilade fire from positions all the way up and down there onto the Japanese who are on this sandbar here, and also in what is today an open field would have originally been coconut trees, but without much ground cover. So the Japanese are really exposed. A number of attacks take place. At one point, the Japanese actually attempt to outflank the marine wire by going into the surf, the, the marine barbed wire line. And the Marines had very little barbed wire to work with at this point in the campaign. They were very short on supplies. The marine barbed wire essentially just kind of goes to the beach. So an entire company of Ichiki's men go into the surf and attempt to uh, come around the end of the marine line. You can see where the logs are sticking out of the, uh, the beach down there. That's as far as they got. The Marines had positions running all the way down there and they essentially just slaughtered that company of Achiki's men. There is in fact a famous uh, photograph from the day after the battle that shows uh, a number, a lot of dead Japanese soldiers in the sand. And that's taken essentially right where those logs are today. Now, the Marines were able to beat back the successive attacks from Ichiki throughout the night of the 21st. Again, the attack started at about 1.30 or 2 in the morning. The entire battle would take about 13 and a half hours because what ended up happening was after the, the wave attacks fail, Ichiki's men dig in on this side of the river. Now, that makes them a little bit harder to get out. They're not as vulnerable to the Marine defensive positions. But the Marines know we have to defeat this force and push them out of their positions. So what happens is the Marines launch a two-pronged enveloping attack. They send a battalion up the river here to cross the river up near where the road is today and then come down the east side. That's one prong. The other prong is the use of a bunch of Stuart light tanks that come across this sandbar to attack the positions right on this side of the field. By about three in the afternoon on the 21st, those two attacks have met up uh, and the, the Achiki di division, or the Achiki uh, group, is essentially annihilated. Colonel Achiki commits ritual suicide in the field back up over here, um, and, and the battle is essentially over at that point. There are a number of really interesting consequences to Alligator Creek. One of them in particular is this is the first time that the that American armed forces have faced off against the Japanese on land and won. And are able to convey the, the results of the battle. There are other, this isn't the first ground engagement for the US of the war. There are battles in the Philippines, Wake Island, some of those places, but there are no American survivors who come back to talk about it. They're all either killed or imprisoned by the Japanese. And it's here that the, essentially the character of the Japanese military is defined for the American forces. It's here where they first experience uh, things that they never would have expected, like wounded Japanese waiting until American soldiers come to either treat them medically or evacuate them off the field, and then rolling over with a hand grenade or attempting to shoot one of the Americans. That, that behavior that wasn't expected from, say, a European army that we'd been fighting like the Germans. And that behavior is like its first experience here and it sticks in the mind. That's the defining understanding of the Japanese army for the American armed forces that will last the rest of the, the war. The idea that the Japanese will try to take one last man with them whenever possible, the Japanese will not surrender, the Japanese will not take prisoners. All of those things are essentially formed right here at Alligator Creek. One of the things that also doesn't really come across in many accounts or depictions of this battle that you see is just how tightly run it was for the Marines. The, the, the goal of the Japanese was to retake the airfield. Well, the airfield, which, by the way, is still around today, it's now Honiara International Airport, it's right on the other side of those trees. We're literally hundreds of meters from Henderson Field right here, and had the Japanese broken the marine lines, they would have immediately been on the airfield, and this would have, that was their objective, and this would have been a huge defeat for the American forces. If Ichiki had managed to capture the airfield, or if the Japanese had sent a larger detachment of men, and they'd been able to break the marine lines and take the airfield, this could have turned the tide of the entire battle. The Americans would have been forced to retreat into the jungle, their organization broken, and the Japanese would have had a significant advantage uh, to try and follow up on. 
what actually happened, of course, is Ichiki is defeated. The Japanese have to reassess what they're going to do, and they decide to make a second attempt to retake, well, retake Henderson Field. The problem they would run into is that their second attempt was, again, not as strong as it should have been. They should have sent an entire division at this point, and they don't. Instead, they follow up with another attack with a brigade. So we'll get into the later battles over Henderson Field in other videos. But I think it's, it's just fantastic to be able to be here on the actual exact site uh, where this really quite historically relevant, very famous battle took place. Unfortunately, the battlefield, like much of this area of Guadalcanal, is slowly being developed, and this area right here is slated for development, for commercial development. So it may not remain in this condition much longer. You can see there is a little bit of housing behind me. Uh, hopefully the battlefield stays accessible for a bit longer, but it's probably not going to be much into the future. Anyway, um, a big thanks to uh, War Historian Battlefield Tours for giving me the opportunity to come out here and see this uh, in person and bring it to you guys. If you're interested in this sort of thing, definitely check them out. This is the sort of tour that they do and it's really cool. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.